Hello, my name is Daniel Sofner. I'm a senior success architect for Salesforce Data Cloud based in Melbourne, Australia. In this second video of a multi-part series, I will be demonstrating how you can share data from a data lake such as Databricks or Amazon Redshift with Salesforce Data Cloud using the zero copy approach. Just to recap, what is the zero copy approach? It is a virtualization technique that makes it easy to access and find data from a data lake, such as Databricks, Amazon Redshift, but also Snowflake and Google BigQuery, by leaving the data in the location it already resides in, but sharing it with Salesforce Data Cloud without actually physically copying the data back and forth. Let's get started. First, let's look at the prerequisites that we need in Databricks to create the zero copy connection with Salesforce Data Cloud. We need a workspace and in the workspace, we need to create a service principle. Let's call it Data Cloud User. That will be the service principle that will be configured in Salesforce Data Cloud to connect to Databricks. We will need to create or generate a client ID and secret for the service principle as well. Then we will create an SQL warehouse in Databricks. Uh, let's use the serverless starter warehouse that will contain data that we can share with Salesforce Data Cloud. Just to show this here, um, in this serverless warehouse, we have some sample data. For example, trip information uh, with a New York City taxi. And what we want to do using Data Federation is we want to surface those data up in Salesforce Data Cloud. Now we are in Salesforce Data Cloud. And the first step we need to do is create a connection to our Databricks environment. We do this using the native Salesforce Data Cloud connectors that are available to a variety of endpoint systems. In this instance, we select Databricks. We provide a connection name. Then we have to select the authentication method we have the chance of using either username and password or client ID and secret. In this case, client ID and secret is definitely the safer option. You have to make sure that you rotate your secret on a regular basis. And then you have to provide the connection details. And the connection details are available in your SQL warehouse information in Databricks. So you go back to Databricks, you go to your serverless starter warehouse, and you select connection details. Now here you have the server host name, HTTP paths, um, a JDBC URL that you can use in your code, and the OAuth URL. What we will need is the server host name. So we copy this into the connection URL in Data Cloud. And we need the HTTP path, which is provided here, and which we will provide in the HTTP path in the Databricks source configuration as well. Once we have provided all of these details, we can test the connection to our Databricks environment, and we can see that the connection was established. Now we can save this connector configuration and continue. After creating the connection, we can now create a new data stream. Here you can see that we have two options. We can either connect directly to Databricks using the zero copy approach, 
Or alternatively, we could also decide to actually physically ingest data from Databricks into Data Cloud. In this case, we're using the first option, which is the zero copy option. In the next window, we have to select the connection that we created earlier, Databricks BYOL. This will now connect to our Databricks instance. We then select the database that we want to use. In this case, it is the samples database. And in the samples database, we select the New York City taxi schema and the trips object that we want to view in Salesforce Data Cloud. On the next page, we provide a name for our object, New York City Taxi Trips. We want to select all of the supporting fields in that object. It is an engagement category because these are taxi trips. So this means we also have to provide an event time field. Let's pick the pickup date and time. And as the primary key, because this object does not have a good primary key, we will use a composite key that consists of the pickup date and time, the drop off date and time, and the trip distance. Click next and here we can decide what data space we want to install um, this data stream into. Let's use the default one. We can decide whether we want to enable acceleration. This is something that we're not going to be using now. And then we can deploy the data stream. After the data stream object has been deployed, we can now go into the data explorer, select data lake object as the object, and our newly deployed New York City taxi trips DLO, which corresponds directly to the deployed DSO. So as you can see here, the data from Databricks are now showing up in Salesforce Data Cloud. These are the same data that we saw earlier in the Databricks query. What's important to know as well is that the data stream shows up here being connected to Databricks using the stream type direct access. So that is our zero copy approach of directly connecting Databricks to Salesforce Data Cloud to view the data in real time. Now I will demonstrate how to share data from Amazon Redshift with Salesforce Data Cloud using a zero copy approach. In order to achieve that, we need access to a workgroup and a namespace in Amazon Redshift serverless. The workgroup will provide us with details around the endpoint that Salesforce Data Cloud will need to call. You will also have to make sure that the workgroup is publicly accessible and not just accessible from within the VPC in which it is running. When creating the namespace, you have to make sure that you specify an admin username and assign a password to that admin username when creating the namespace. That is a piece of information that is also required when connecting Salesforce Data Cloud to Amazon Redshift. The last thing you will need to do is modify the security group that is used by Amazon Redshift, uh, you will have to open up the Amazon Redshift instance to a set of IP addresses that are used by Salesforce Data Cloud. 
I've done that here in the inbound rules. Now the question is, how do you know which IP addresses to allow? This is documented in the Salesforce documentation where it is specified which IP addresses are used by data cloud services. And this is also depending on the AWS region and the VPC ID. In order to find the right IP addresses, you will have to go into the data cloud setup and you will have to specify or check where your instant is located. So in this case, it is located in the US East one region and it is using the CDP5 VPC. So if you go back to this list, in this table, you find the region. In our case, it is US East one and you find the right VPC ID, which is CDP5. So here you will have a list of six IP addresses that you will have to put on an allow list in your AWS security group. Once you've done all of this configuration, Salesforce Data Cloud will be able to communicate with your Amazon Redshift instance. In this case, we will be accessing sample data in a sample database on Amazon Redshift. So you can configure the sample database here. It has a set of schemas, for example, ticket um, schemas. And within the tickets schema, you have tables that show the sales of tickets uh, for a particular event. So I did a select all from ticket sales and you can see here are the results that we want to surface up in Salesforce Data Cloud as well. Now we are ready to create a connection to our Amazon Redshift instance. We do this again by going to New Connectors and we select the Amazon Redshift connection. Here we have to provide a connection name. Let's call it Redshift BYOL. Now, as a username, you now have to provide the admin user that you created in Amazon Redshift, and you have to provide the corresponding password. Under connection details, you now have to provide the connection URL that you got in Amazon Redshift. Do not forget to put the port 5439 in there as well. And on the database, we provide the name of the sample database that we will be accessing. We can test the connection and we can see that the connection was successfully established. This allows us now to save our source to Amazon Redshift. Now we can create a new data stream object and the corresponding data lake object. Under sources, we select Amazon Redshift. In this screen here under connection, we select the new connection to Amazon Redshift that we created earlier. And under database, we just leave the sample data dev database in there, which contains the schema that we want, namely, the ticket schema and the corresponding sales object. We leave out the others for now and just focus on ticket sales. In the next screen, we have to provide an object name. We have to select all of the fields that we want to view in Salesforce Data Cloud using the zero copy approach. These are ticket sales, so we have to select the engagement category here. As the event time field, we select the sale time. As the primary key, we select the sales ID. And in the next screen, like with any zero copy, bring your own lake connections, we have to select the data space in which our data source object will be installed. 
and we have the choice of enabling or not enabling acceleration. Now we're ready to deploy our new data stream. Now, after the data stream has been deployed and the corresponding data lake object has been created, we can now access it in our data explorer. And we can see here the ticket sales engagement object. So we can see here the details of our ticket sales inside of Salesforce Data Cloud, which has established a zero copy connection to our Amazon Redshift environment. And the results are the same that we can see here in our Redshift query editor. And very similarly to the examples that we gave for Google BigQuery, for Snowflake, for Databricks, also the stream type here to Redshift is direct access. It's not an ingestion, but it's a direct connectivity to that external data lake and that allows the data from that data lake to show up in our Salesforce Data Cloud instance. Thank you very much for watching and listening to this demo. I hope you found it useful. 